Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Monday. It's time to kick off the week with Bill Landis and me, Austin Ward. And there is no better way to start off a Monday than talking about Ohio State tight ends. Wouldn't you agree, Bill? That's how I like to start every week. When like when we're not recording, I'll just like go find my wife or like my dog and start talking to them about Ohio State tight ends like first thing Monday morning every week. Yeah, there's it's just like it's better than a cup of coffee. That's where the That's juice right. comes. You start, you know, picturing 13 personnel and Keenan Bailey spending 25 hours a day in the Woody. That's right. He works so hard that he has an extra hour he he's finds able extra to find. Hour. Um so Bill wrote about and he, as we go through his, uh, you know, state of the positions, present and future, with sometimes a little look back at the past, uh, which there certainly was in the tight ends at uh, OhioState.Rivals.com. I thought it was uh, an interesting look at this group because, sort of in hindsight, you look at Cade Stover's numbers and you think, well, that was a pretty impactful year for an Ohio State tight end as a receiving threat. But then, as a, a couple months go by, you think you look back like. Cade was good, got injured a little bit. Mitch Rossi was very effective in the way that they used him. But it did feel like maybe the tight end position as a whole didn't have as great of an impact as Ryan Day would have wanted. Yeah, there were like – so like going through and sort of compiling things for the, for the tight end piece, there were there were two things that, that jumped out at me. One, like I went game by game for Cade Stover because in my mind I was like, oh, he had a little bit of a drop-off at the end of the year. From a receptions and like touchdown standpoint, he really didn't. It was it was fairly consistent throughout the course of the year. I think that the blocking certainly did, and as we talked about before, I think much of that is is tied to injury. But I think part of it too is just like he still was learning a new position, and in theory, he'll be better at that this year. But I I wanted to see whether or not my thought on Cade was true, and and I think it actually probably wasn't. He was fairly consistent as a receiver over the course of the year. I guess that drop against Michigan, notwithstanding, I know people get hung up on that right, rightfully so, but, but he had a solid year, but, and then the other thing was that they, I think very clearly did not really trust what they had outside of Cade and Mitch all that much. And the nature of Mitch's skill set uh, as more of like a H back fullback backfield blocker, as opposed to a guy who can line up on the line of scrimmage and block a defensive end. Um, I think probably left them not able to play with as much traditional uh, 12 and th- maybe not 13, but 12 personnel as they wanted to like outside of short yardage and, and goal line. Clearly they did it in those situations. Like that's kind of what everybody does it. But if you think about Ryan Day's career here as more of the head coach, I guess less so than the offensive coordinator prior to becoming the head coach, like he wants to do the, the two tight end stuff like, at all points of the field. I think he likes the advantages from a matchup perspective that that can give you. And they weren't able to get to it a ton last year. And I think they'd very much like to get back to that this year. So that's kind of like the overarching thing for me as I look at this group going into 2023 is how can they get back to the point where they felt so comfortable with like Luke Farrell and Jer- Luke Farrell and Jeremy Rucker um, to play that much? Like, can they get to that place with, with this particular group? Yeah, it almost feels like when you evaluate afterwards, like maybe that was just something of a bridge year for the tight ends because as you mentioned, Kate Stover was still – uh, learning that position he went into last spring still trying to play linebacker and did so for a, like five or six practices before mm-hmm. they brought him back uh you know joe royer was expected to make that next step and then was hampered uh by a groin injury that really slowed him down physically throughout the year in addition to dealing with um you know a, a very tough situation off the field with the loss of his mother um those two things really didn't allow him to do much until late in November. He started seeing some of that spark with that. That again, either way, if it even even if everything had worked out in the best interest for him, that still would have been his first year as a a play in, play out tight end. G Scott, we've talked a number of times about, you know, his move over and inside to tight end from wide receiver and the challenges of bulking up his frame and being able to block um, you know, sort of inline stuff. Like all three of those guys we're not going to be finished products as tight ends a year ago. Cade got pretty close, I think, mm-hmm. just because of the way he plays. But if that's true, then that means you can project forward steps for for all three of those guys that could be pretty significant for Ohio State. Yeah, I, I, I looking back, like I found myself maybe wanting a little more from the position as a whole, but I also am like pretty bullish on it. Move, moving into this year, even even in you know despite that maybe lack of production outside of Kate Stover from last year, I think they have a lot of really good pieces. And 
Um, you're like the like I think Joe Royer would have made that leap last year had he not been injured, and then as you said, had had the off the field stuff that he unfortunately had to, had to go through. Um, that's like the kind of things you can't predict. But he was on an upward trajectory prior to that, and and it just didn't hit for him. I think it probably will hit for him this year based off the things that Keenan Bailey has said about him in the off season and just like kind of talking to Joe and getting inside his mind a little bit to kind of figure out where he is. I, I think he is back to where he was, I guess, this time last year when he looked like he was about to step up and, and play a significant role for the offense. So if you have him and you have and Kate Stover, I think you feel pretty good. But then like, you know, you get into the depth and like I think G Scott can do some things to help the offense depending on how they want to use him. Um We'll see about like Sam Hart and, and Bennett Christian, I guess. But then like you throw Jelani Thurman into the mix, who's like a total wild card. And unlike anybody, I think we've seen at the position for Ohio State. And, and you can see a lot of different avenues for that position to become much more impactful than it was last year. All right, let's get into the Jelani of it all. Let's do what, it. What is realistic? <laughs> like, seriously, what is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, he's a freak. I know yeah. that. I can see that with my own eyes. I don't. I don't need help. I don't need Keenan Bailey to describe that part to me. I can, but the first I wrote about him last week, I thought that he was, I gave him the edge over Carnell Tate for my freshman spring MVP. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And the play that is burned in my mind is that first scrimmage that we got to see the last drive there, that Kyle McCord was leading. They throw it, they flip something out down the left side to Jelani and he drops his shoulder and basically just bulldozes two dudes to get to the goal line. Thought that he scored. The officials didn't give it to him. There was a lot of shenanigans going on with that at the end of practice. That was the play that I was like, okay, maybe there is something going on here that I might have to talk about. That that play, when we first got on the practice field, I was like, who's that? Like, I don't, <laughs> that guy, I don't remember that guy. Who is he? Because uh, he was like, just, I think I've said before, he's like way bigger than I thought he would be. I, I don't know why. I was envisioning more like a 6'6", 220-pound guy, and it turns out he's a 6'6", 250-pound guy and moves really well. I was like, okay, well, that's better than I thought it would be. I, th I think Ohio State might be able to work with that uh, with Johnny as a true freshman. So I don't know. Like, I, I don't want to overlook the fact that tight end is a difficult position to play. And Jelani was like basically a receiver in high school. So, so clearly he has a lot of things he needs to learn from the blocking side, the technical standpoint, learning the entirety of the offense as is required by that position when you're both a blocker and a receiver. Like I get all that, but I, like he can help. I, I just don't, I, he can help them this year. So I, I don't know how they're going to use them. I, I guess maybe I would, I would like to see him be part of a red zone package and, and use that big frame and let them box guys out and, and be a threat in the end zone. Um, if he can't like Ryan day's thing is like, we want to, we want to trust you to put you on the field by yourself in 11 personnel before we entertain the idea of putting you on the field in, in 12 personnel or 13 personnel, which, which is all well and good. I think that that's sound logic. And I don't know if Jelani would be ready to be the tight end in a world where everyone else in the room didn't exist. Um, but I would hate for that to like keep him off the field. Um, they, there's not a lot of precedent, I think, at Ohio State for tight ends to play as, as true freshmen, like not even Jeremy Ruckert, who was a very highly rated recruit, did all that much in his first year. Um, but I feel like in a world where if you have Cade and you have Joe, who you feel pretty comfortable with, and like G, who's a veteran guy and seen some stuff and been around, and like there's not a whole lot on Jelani's sh shoulders, maybe then you can try to utilize him in some more um, – specific ways maybe that you would otherwise be hesitant to do so if you were um i don't know like the second or third guy on your on your depth chart and you were afraid of experimenting with him a little bit if that makes sense yeah i think jeremy ruckert's probably the highest profile example of that like i remember you know a lot of ohio state fans or and some of the media coverage during that year it's like well he was the number one tight end in the country why can't you find some way to even just use him in the red zone he's got the receiving skills like just carve out that unique package and i can't really speak i don't know if other programs do that like ohio state is the one that i watch week in week out every single snap that they play and i know that they don't want to i don't know if there are other schools that are like well we have this really raw young tight end we're gonna throw him a, a jump ball in the red zone just because that's all he can do right now i don't I don't know how common that is. Like, I, I really don't. I, I, I don't have uh, I don't have the book on that either for other programs. I, I don't know um, how they tend to utilize their freshmen. I, I, like, I think a lot of times Ohio State fans 
feel like they look across the rest of college football and feel like they see everybody playing their freshmen very early. And for some reason, Ohio State doesn't do that. I don't know how much that is actually the reality, but I don't know. It still feels to me like there's there's enough room to, to do it. I'm looking at Jeremy Ruckert's um, snap counts now from his freshman year, and he played 23 in each of the first three games of that year and then like played, I don't know, 40 the rest of the year. Um, so they played him a fair amount in the blowouts in early season, but he was just not a part of the plan once it got into like the, the, the meat of the year. And he ended up with uh, two targets that year. So <laughs> they didn't really throw him the ball all that much. He had one, he had one catch on two targets. So I'm hoping that, that Jelani Thurman's existence is a little bit uh, more involved than that as a true freshman. I, yeah, I would probably put a couple units on the fact that Jelani Thurman will get more than two targets. Uh, yeah, I would hope so. If he doesn't, I think we're going to be talking about it quite a bit <laughs> throughout the course of the year. Um, I, yeah, I, I just – it's the same thing I feel with, like, Sonny Styles and C.J. Hicks. It's like I get that guys, like, have to earn things on some level. And I'm not saying that, like – I like. well, I guess th- those other guys are older. But, like, I'm not saying Jelani should be the starter because he's a freak. But I also think that when you get guys like that in your program, it's kind of okay to embrace those things that that make them the way that they are, even if it's just a little bit when they're younger players and they're not ready to kind of take on the full load of of being a starter. So I think Ohio State is sometimes hesitant to do that. Not always. Like we like Travion Henderson got a lot of work as a freshman. Garrett Wilson, as we talked about before, got a lot of work as a freshman. Like they'll do it, but um, I think they could do it more. And, and I'm a little, I don't know, hopeful anyway that they do it with Jelani. Yep. At the top, it does help, of course, that you have Cade Stover coming back. And I, th- I think that he's really one of the people that can determine the ceiling for Ohio State this year in a way that is, goes beyond just how much is Ohio State going to throw it to him. Is his uh, perimeter blocking better when he's fully healthy? Like, mm-hmm. the, the mindset and leadership, that that's the hard part to quantify, but the guy had broken bones in his back um and once he was off the field in the peach bowl things really changed for ohio state but he didn't miss any reps in spring which is kind of insane to me and then i asked him about it afterwards he's like berm and i were you know talking with him you know uh, the week after the game he was still in the hospital i believe as he was making his decision to get if he was going to come back or go to the nfl draft and it's like yeah this thing was a little more serious than they thought you know still working on it and it's like he just goes leaves the hospital and is like i'm going straight back to do workouts and i'm not going to miss any parts it was a broken bone in his back and that's the kind of rugged you know work ethic mentality that i think ohio state's got to have um he can set the tone for that him on one side and Tommy Eichenberg on the other, I I don't think should be overlooked. They may not, you know, be first round NFL draft picks, but they're going to be instrumental in determining the attitude that this team plays with. I think last year, like there was a lot of we're tough kind of talk or we're going to be tough kind of talk. And it showed up at times and at other times I thought it was it was lacking a little bit, but I it's not like something you can just say and it like it happens magically. Like I think you have to like you know, you gotta be about it. And and I think that Kate is. I think that Tommy is and probably need more guys like that on the roster. I think I think as the 2021 recruiting class rises up here, there are some more guys I think who who fit that bill, which is part of the reason why I, I think Ohio State can maybe take a step forward this year. Um, but Kate is a, is a tone setter in that way. Like I felt that if you talk to him even prior to last year, like you're around him and like he just like sort of emanates that. But then you saw him on the field almost immediately last year. Like, OK, like that's the guy. Um, maybe you'd, you'd like it to come from some other places on the offense in addition to him. But I thought that he brought that every week, even when he didn't play his best. I still thought he, he brought that and he's going to need to continue to bring it. And it's very important. Like we don't, I probably didn't talk about that enough. Honestly, last year, we, we saw some of the highlight plays that he made early on in the year. Um, the big catch in the Penn state game when he ran the guy over, like you need that stuff too, obviously. But um, I think the, the edge that he helps cultivate for your offense in particular is extremely important and will be this year. At the top with you know Keenan Bailey, you have a first time, first time full time head coach, a position coach there in uh, Keenan Bailey. That I didn't really describe that role very well for him uh, <laughs> at all. Really butchered it to be honest. I, I've talked about him for a long time, so people probably don't want to 
hear me praise his journey any more than I already have. What did you make uh, of his spring and, and sort of his role in shaping this moving forward? My, my view on Keenan has always sort of been, I, I wasn't certain what his shot would look like. But once he got it, I feel like he would really like embrace it and make the most of it. And like that hasn't changed for me. Um, he is uh, he has a kind of personality that I just think like like makes you think that he's destined for for bigger things um, and and the work ethic to, to back it up and, and, and the football acumen, too. I think if you, like he's he's kind of an encyclopedia of football knowledge with all the different jobs he's held at Ohio State. So like I, I am I'm pretty high on his prospects as, as a coach and. I am also high on the, I guess, the potential for the position group. And like, I, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but like Kevin Wilson was like wearing two hats. He was the offensive coordinator. He was a tight ends coach. And it often felt like the offensive coordinator hat was uh, far more time consuming for him. Like the, the tight end position was just like the other thing that he did, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Keenan, ba Keenan Bailey, all he has to do is worry about coaching the tight ends. And knowing the passion that he has for his job and, and how much he wants to, I guess, like prove right the people that, that do feel the way that I think you and I feel about him, or maybe prove wrong the people that doubt he's as good as we say you say are. Like I think that combined is going to bring something else out of this tight end position. And I'd probably think that about whichever position that Keenan was coaching, but the tight end group with like the collection of guys they have there, it's not a huge position group, might be uniquely positioned to take a step forward compared to some other places where Keenan could have perhaps ended up. So I think he's going to be really good. I think he's going to be good uh, on the field. I think he's going to be excellent on the recruiting trail. I think you're seeing some dividends from that already with what they have committed in 2024. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I guess I'm prepared to be wrong if it turns out that way, but I, I don't I don't think we're going to be. I think I think the confidence we have in him is, is properly placed. Right. Yeah. I, the stuff that he's done to help Ohio State behind the scenes is – is really remarkable. I wanted to write about it or talk about it or do podcast episodes about it for a really long time. And Ohio state was resistant to that, which probably, uh, with good reason because their rival once turned them in for having, you know, quality <laughs> control people doing too much stuff in the summer. So probably if I wrote down some of the things that Keenan Bailey was and others and not just him, others like Ohio state has a really good sports staff. Um, you know, Maybe they well, maybe they would have been ju justifiably concerned that Jim Harbaugh was going to call the NCAA about that again, um, but you know there's there's was really cool stuff like him Keenan Bailey going through every single play that they ran, I think for three or four years and like what defense they faced did this work because they go through the buckets and it would be like all right well this is it helped them streamline the process of what you needed based on advanced scouting for the defense you're going to face here's our 10 or 12 plays that they're green they're they're go this is what we like against uh, what we're going to see this week and gives them a jump start on that stuff that was a long-term project like a graduate level thesis that keenan bailey was working on for a <laughs> long time and that's again proprietary information that they probably wouldn't want me to write about but like it's really cool like how long did that take uh you know how many hours of film and and what was the methodology for determining success like there's so much involved in that. And that's the kind of work that he was doing when he wasn't doing the more traditional, you know, football instruction and in footwork and opening up the woody for these guys late at night. Like that's the kind of stuff that really that's why I talk about Keenan Bailey the way that I do. That that's the kind of stuff that I noticed about him too. Like I wasn't I don't know, I wasn't as as close to some of that as you were, as you were like, you know, talking with Keenan throughout his rise through the program, I guess, but it's stuff that I observed from afar and it was just like super impressive. Um I don't I, I think there is a danger or, or there's a balance between always promoting from within, going out and finding newer and or, or different voices to help elevate elevate your program. And Ryan Day, I think, especially on the offensive side, maybe is, is a little more inclined to promote from within because he trusts the infrastructure that he built there. And Keenan Bailey has come up within that infrastructure. So I understand that. But even if he was like, if I knew everything I knew about Keenan Bailey and he was at like Ball State and they decided to hire him, um, I was like, okay, good hire. Cause I, cause I just like, he's, he's just really sharp. Like he's for a guy who like didn't play high level college football and didn't like bounce around to a million different programs. Um, he has a football knowledge that I find quite impressive and a passion for it 
that I think will will help him utilize that knowledge to the best of his ability. So um, I'm like I'm excited to see see what that does for him. To be perfectly honest, because like he is, I think he's like a good dude too. So like you want you want to see. I think good people su- succeed in, in that profession as well. So um, I, I think it's going to work out quite well for Ohio State that they put him in that position. All right. What was the the future cast looking like as you lo- broke down the recruiting success? There's already one commit in the fold for Ohio State. All these guys really have the opportunity to come back for more than one season. I don't think that that would yeah. be the case, um, at least not for Cade Stover. It, it won't be. Um it's kind of hard to imagine a world where G Scott stays for two more years, but um, certainly he could. Um, Joe Royer, I think you can assume would be leading that group at this time next year, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, what did you What did you get a feel for there? I was surprised that Kate had eligibility left beyond this year. I, <laughs> I didn't realize that, but I agree with you. I don't. I don't think he'll use it. I think he'll he'll go out in a blaze of glory with uh, with Steel and Tommy. Um, even though they'll probably like, like they'll leave and like burn that house down. So no one else can ever live there again. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah, so I think he'll be gone. I agree on G. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe G will say, I don't, I don't want to make assumptions about G. It's just like a long time to like hang around and, and not be a starter. And, and I don't, I don't see a world where he's tight end one next year. I think that will probably be Joe Royer, as you said. Um, but if it's like Joe Royer and Jelani Thurman as your two top, top tight ends, feel pretty good about that. Um, I don't know how much we'll get to see of Sam Hart and Bennett Christian this year, but hopefully there's enough to make you feel good about what's coming behind Joe. And I guess like if they're ahead of Jelani technically, but, but I think Jelani probably has surpassed those guys in terms of how he's viewed in the pecking order or as close to it. Um, and then like Max LeBlanc in this class, Damari and Winton from Glenville, if they get him, they'll, they'll maybe finally get the fabled two man recruiting class that they've been trying to get forever. Um, I could see them trying to do it again in 2025 with the way that the things are kind of shaping up for for that room. But I also have confidence in Keenan's ability to get that done on the recruiting trail too. So um, I think the outlook for the future looks looks pretty good. Um, I I wish I had more information on Joe Royer, but I he's a guy who I'd buy stock in as well. So um, I think for the present and the future, it looks like a fairly strong position for them. All right, a. Monday tight end edition of the podcast daily plus a bonus stonk watch from Bill Lance. Mm. What what more could you possibly ask for? Uh, hope that this gets your week started right. Another one of the off season that we're just going to mark out and uh, head into a holiday weekend and time will be flying by. It'll be late July. We'll be an indie before you know it. Mm. Hope so. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, anyway, thanks again for joining us. That's Bill. I'm Austin. We will talk to you later.